The history of astronomy in China goes all the way back to prehistoric times and developed completely independently from the rest of the world. As is the case with many of the innovations in Chinese civilization, they are further ahead or at least on par with the rest of the world in their astronomical developments, although surprisingly we'll see that in some ways they also lag behind. This is the Physics Almanac where we cover all things physics and physics related, ranging from topics that require no physics background to very advanced physics. If you're here for the first time, welcome, and if you're a returning viewer, it's good to see you again. If you have no interest in physics whatsoever, you're likely in the middle of a YouTube binge, and hopefully you'll stick around and maybe discover a new interest. As I mentioned, the history of astronomy in China dates all the way back to prehistoric times, meaning before the advent of writing, and develops independently from the rest of the world. I covered prehistoric astronomy in the first video of this series, titled The Early Days, Essentially, we see the same thing all over the world. Down here, we have an example of a Stonehenge-like structure called the Tausi Observatory. This is a modern recreation, and this structure serves as a solar calendar. You can see that on different days of the year, the rising sun will shine through a different slit, allowing you to track the time of the year. The actual archaeological site is shown right here. So far in this series, we've mostly been focused on astronomy in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean area, where we saw that these cultures developed a constellation system mapping out different areas in the sky, with a special set of constellations known as the Zodiac, through which the planets, the sun, and the moon appear to travel. Well, since China was also looking at the same sky as the rest of the planet, they also developed their own set of constellations and their own Zodiac made up of 12 or 13 symbols. Of course, they come up with their own signs of the zodiac with their own astrological properties that have nothing to do with the Mediterranean or Western zodiac. The only thing they have in common is that they cover the same set of stars. Now, the beginnings of Chinese astronomy from a civilization point of view, meaning once things start to be written down, aren't known for sure, but we do have a few pieces of the puzzle. One thing we can say is that the earliest Chinese constellations were developed at the latest around 400 BC, almost certainly sometime before then, but we don't know exactly when. Probably our main source for the early developments of Chinese astronomy is a book called the Zhu Bi Suan Jing. I have almost certainly butchered this name and will likely continue to do so throughout the rest of this video. I don't speak any Chinese languages, so you'll have to forgive me for that. The Zhu Bi Suan Jing is a compilation of scientific, mathematical, and astronomical texts and theories, and the earliest version we have dates to around 200 AD. But it's pretty much accepted that many of the texts in this book date to much earlier. For example, it contains a derivation of the Pythagorean theorem, which we can actually see on this image. Of course, it's not called the Pythagorean theorem in China. It was developed independently, and actually, it's pretty much universally accepted that Pythagoras was not the first person to come up with this theorem, even in the eastern Mediterranean area, as it was known by the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians over a thousand years before him. It is still possible he discovered it independently. In China, this theorem is called the Gogu theorem. However, it has been argued that even this Gogu fella is not the first Chinese person to have discovered this theorem. Some have argued that it should be called the Sheng Gao theorem after a mathematician named Sheng Gao who lived during the Zhu dynasty. The Zhu dynasty is what this book is named after, hence the first word Zhu Bi. This Zhu dynasty dates back to around 1200 BC. So the origins of Chinese astronomy and even mathematics are often dated back to this Zhu dynasty. If you're enjoying this video so far, please let the YouTube algorithm know about it and take a second to like and subscribe and maybe share it with some of your friends. There are a couple important astronomical findings in this book. One is that it claims that the motion of the sky throughout the day is due to the Earth's rotation. So sometime between 1200 BC and 200 AD, the Chinese figure out that the Earth is spinning, or at least they posit that it's spinning. The Zhu Bi Suan Jing also contains a derivation of Eratosthenes' method. In the previous video discussing the Greeks, we saw that Eratosthenes was the first person to measure the circumference of the Earth by comparing the angle of incident sunlight at different latitudes on Earth. However, in the Zhu Bi Suan Jing, this method is used to calculate the distance to the sun instead. 
In both cases, they notice that at different latitudes, the sun's rays come in at a different angle. But in Eratosthenes' case, he's arguing this is due to the curvature of the Earth, while in the Zhu Bi Suan Jing, they're arguing that this is due to changes in position relative to the sun. This is called parallax. This implies that in 200 AD, the Chinese believed the Earth to be flat. By the way, if you carry out this calculation, assuming a flat Earth, you'll find that the distance to the Sun is about the radius of the Earth, so 6,000 kilometers or so. The actual distance to the Sun is about 150 million kilometers. We'll discuss this flat Earth question a little bit later in the video. Now, even though the origins of Chinese astronomy can be dated back probably to around 1200 BC, thanks to this Zhu Bi Suan Jing book, the founders of Chinese astronomy are largely regarded to be two fellows named Shi Shen Fu and Gan De, who both lived at the same time in the 4th century BC. These two guys start cataloging stars the way an actual astronomer would. They also make a couple discoveries. Shi Shen Fu is the first person in recorded history to have discovered sunspots, which he calls mini eclipses. Now, it's unclear to me what exactly he means by calling them mini eclipses. Is he just calling them that because it looks like there's some small round spot blocking part of the sun? Or does he actually believe this is how eclipses begin? That actual eclipses are just these mini eclipses that manage to grow to the size of the sun. If the latter is the case, then we can infer that in the 4th century BC in China, they haven't figured out that eclipses are a result of the moon passing between the sun and the earth. Personally, that seems a little bit unlikely to me. Gande is credited as possibly having been the first person to sight the moons of Jupiter, but we don't know for sure. He writes that he noticed Jupiter had a small red companion that followed it around. So you would think, well, obviously that's a moon. And that seems possible as Jupiter has over 100 moons, but it has four big moons. The problem is, none of these moons, including the four large moons, are actually visible to the naked eye. So how could he possibly have seen one? Well, it has been argued by some that at the time, given the relative positions of the Earth and Jupiter, and the atmospheric conditions of China in the 4th century, that maybe it would actually have been possible to spot one of these moons with the naked eye. However, he describes this moon as being red, and none of the four large moons of Jupiter are red. So it's unclear what exactly he saw. I would like to point out that apart from Shi Shen Fu and Gan De, the next observation of sunspots and Jupiter's moons are made by Galileo, almost 2,000 years later. Okay, the Chinese are maybe behind with the flat Earth question, but here they're way ahead. A few hundred years after these guys, we get a man named Zhang Heng. Zhang Heng is sometimes considered the greatest Chinese astronomer, as he catalogs over 2,500 stars. If you saw my video on the Greeks, you'll know that the greatest Greek astronomer, so it is said, was Hipparchus, who cataloged about 850 stars. And not only did he catalog a lot more stars, at this point in history, the Chinese have the most accurate and precise star charts of anyone on Earth. And they will continue to lead the world in this field until the Arabs come along. Now I should say, it's always possible the Mayans had them beat, but we don't really know how accurate the Mayans were as the Spanish priests burned all their books. Zheng Heng is also famous for his so-called egg model of the universe, in which he claims the universe is like an egg, where the earth is like the yolk, surrounded by the heavens represented as the egg white. This means the Chinese are following a geocentric model. The earth is at the center of the universe. Some have argued that this egg model implies that Zheng Heng believes in a round earth, because the yolk, representing the earth, is round. However, this appears to be a metaphor, as Zhang Heng writes explicitly that he thinks the Earth is flat. A couple hundred years later, we get another guy named Yu Qi. Yu Qi is the first Chinese to posit the idea that the Earth might be round. He does not actually say he thinks the Earth is round, he just says it's a possibility. The first Chinese person we know of to actually argue that the Earth is round is a man named Li Ye in the 13th century AD. Although he, and Yu Qi as well, do not make this argument on the basis of observation, they make it on the basis of some sort of geometric philosophical argument. Yu Qi argues, well, the heavens are round, so it would make sense that the earth might be round as well. And Li Ye argues that the earth must be round because were it to be flat, 
This would disrupt the flow of planetary motion. Yuxi also discovers the precession of the equinoxes. If you saw my video on the Greeks, you'll know that this was first discovered by Hipparchus in the 2nd century BC, but Yuxi, although he's a little bit later, makes the discovery independently. If you don't know what the precession of the equinoxes means, this refers to the wobbling of the Earth's axis like a top. So the Earth spins on a rotational axis that points in some direction, which we call north, and points towards the North Star. However, the direction this axis point isn't fixed and wobbles around like a top over a period of about 26,000 years. So over this period, the Earth's rotational axis points at a different star, so we don't always have the same North Star. The last Chinese astronomer I'm going to discuss was a man named Shen Kuo in the 11th century AD. Shen Kuo is the first person to discover the difference between magnetic and true north. He uses this discovery to invent magnetic compasses used for navigation. Magnetic compasses did exist before him, but they were never used for navigation. They were used for metaphysical purposes like divining certain things about the future or a person's character, kind of like astrology. But thanks to Shen Kuo, the whole world now uses magnetic compasses as a tool for navigation. Up until now, Chinese astronomy has been developing completely independently from the rest of the world. They do eventually get into contact with their neighbors and realize, hey, they're doing astronomy too. At which point, astronomical ideas and astronomical findings start to mix. The first astronomers they come into contact with are the Indians, who we have not discussed yet. This starts with the spread of Buddhism from India into China. But the influence of Indian astronomy really ramps up during the Tang Dynasty, when Chinese courts start to hire Indian astronomers, so they actually bring Indian astronomers into China to work for them. A little bit later, they come into contact with Arab astronomers. And again, they start to hire Arab astronomers and bring them into their courts. As I mentioned earlier, the Chinese astronomers were leading the world in astronomy in the sense of taking the most precise and accurate measurements, but they are surpassed by the Arabs. And the Chinese figure this out and realize, well, why try to compete with them? They're doing a good job, let's just hire them. Arab astronomy becomes almost fully integrated into Chinese astronomy with the Mongol Empire, because at this point the Mongol Empire covers both China and the Arab Empire, or at least the eastern half of the Arab Empire. So now there's no issue of competing empires, it's all one empire and ideas are flowing freely. And finally, China eventually comes into contact with European astronomers during the Age of Exploration. And shockingly, it's not until this point that the Chinese accept that the Earth is round, 2,000 years after the Greeks. To be clear, they weren't ideologically opposed to the Earth being round, they just apparently had no reason to think so. And they don't switch to round Earth as a result of European astronomy, they do so because they find out that the Europeans sailed around the Earth. At which point they say, well, these guys sailed around the Earth, I guess the Earth is round. They have absolutely no problem accepting this. So how could it be that these great astronomers who for centuries were leading the world with the most accurate star charts, the most accurate data, and even when the Arabs surpassed them, they're still pretty much right there. It's not like they're blown out of the water or anything, and yet they never actually figure out the Earth is round. Well, this goes back to my argument I made in the previous video on how the Greeks figured out the Earth was round, where I argued that discovering the Earth was round likely came from a maritime civilization a civilization that spent a lot of energy sailing in open seas. Which is why I argued in the previous video that the Phoenicians, who were a great maritime civilization accustomed to sailing in open seas, would likely have figured out the Earth was round, as they would have observed objects disappearing below the horizon or appearing to drop below the horizon, as well as having needed to learn celestial navigation. In open seas, you need to use the stars to figure out where you are. Now, of course, the Chinese had ships and sailors, but they weren't a maritime culture in the sense that it was part of their identity, and I would guess that they probably sailed mostly along the coastlines. And in that case, you can just use land to figure out your position. So that basically covers the history of Chinese astronomy. Since they eventually start mixing ideas with their neighbors, eventually Chinese astronomy is no longer uniquely Chinese, it's just astronomy but they always maintain their own astronomical conventions such as the zodiac and other constellations. 
In the next video, we'll continue with other civilizations practicing astronomy during what I'm loosely calling the Classical Antiquity Era, and we're going to travel to the other side of the world into the Americas where we'll discuss the Maya. So if you enjoyed this video and would like to continue this journey through the history of astronomy, be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified for the release of future videos. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.